<coughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, hopefully you can hear and see me. Um, I've resolved all of my problems with Facebook Live producer. If you're not hearing me, um, <coughs> let me know. You just just send me a send me a message. Uh, apologies for, for last week's snafus. It was entirely the fault of Facebook, of course. Technology is what enables all of this stuff and also makes it a good deal more difficult for us. Um, compatibility issues and stuff like that. So it's done, it's taken care of, and um, you'll just have to put up with me sniffling and coughing a little bit. Um, apologies in advance. I'm a little bit under the weather with asthma and allergies, so... Um, sit through the sniffles and coughs and hopefully we've got a little bit of good material here for you. <clears throat> you should have open in front of you the book of Daniel chapter 2 and you should also have open in front of you a source sheet that I sent out and it's on the um, the Shir Hadash Facebook page. It also went out in the email that went out to my email list. Um, don't get frightened, okay? Please do not be frightened by this um, long and seemingly complicated um, uh, source sheet and all that. If you recall, uh, Rabbi Brander came to speak at Shir Chadash recently and gave us like a 25-page one, so I'm about one-fifth of that. Uh, the basic technique that I've used here, I actually realized, is uh, it's the Rabbi Sachs technique of learning, of learning Talmud and of learning anything, and that is make a chart, make a chart of everything, and then things become clear. Um, that's certainly something that, that I learned from him many, many years ago and have stuck with, and it's, in the terms of the book of Daniel, it's certainly going to work very, very well. The goal that, that I have for this course is to get through the 12 chapters of the book of Daniel and then have a clear picture in our mind of all the visions that are there and all of the pictures, the scenes that, um, that we're presented with. Because this is going to help us understand Tanakh. As we saw in the previous couple of classes, and I'm going to point this out to you again a couple of times today, um, <coughs> The Hebrew Bible really can only be understood with a knowledge of the, of the book of Daniel, and specifically what we're going to get into in this particular chapter. Okay? Uh, what I have with all the colors on the first page of my, my source sheet is how the chapter divides. We do have to bear in mind when we're, when we're reading anything in Tanakh that the Division into chapters dates from like the 12th, 13th century is Christian in origin. As our good friend Isaac Moses has po pointed out, it's not only Christian in origin, it is anti-Jewish in its intentions. The chapter divisions, if you look very carefully, are uh, meant to separate the messages of consolation and inspiration from the, the difficult prophecies. Um, again, that's, that's something to, to look into at a different date. A large part of this chapter, there are 49 verses to it, a large part of this chapter is the king has a dream and for some reason the dream is forgotten or else he pretends that he forgot it uh, to test the wise men. And he decides that since the wise men cannot tell what the dream means, they can't tell what the dream was and they can't tell what the dream means, he's going to have to kill all of them in punishment. And we're going to look at Midrashim that will explain what that is about and we're going to see something really, really, really amazing coming from the, from the Midrashim. Uh, Daniel prays about a third of the way through. We have a classic prayer of Daniel. And then we get the dream. God tells Daniel what the dream is, what it's about, what it means, and Daniel goes, tells the king, and then gives the interpretation. What you're going to have to pay very careful attention to is right at the very end, there's going to be a difference between what Daniel tells the king the dream is, and then when he starts to interpret it, he is going to give a slightly different version of the dream. 
So that brings us to the elements of the dream chart. Got to have charts, and <coughs> the more colors on them, the easier they are to understand. You will see that the elements of the dream in chapter two is right there on the first page of my source sheet. There are four elements, but there are in fact five elements, and there are in fact five nations. It's not just the progression of all the great nations that are going to come and go in the course of history. It's going to be largely about what is going to be with this fourth kingdom that is more than one nation. And again, we'll see in Malvin how he looks at that and the parallels that I think we can see very clearly in our, in our own time. I'm not really going to focus a lot on how the end of days prophecies are playing out in our time. That's, that's a subject you can find on the internet and in books all over the place. You don't need me to help you with that. But I think Malbim is going to be very significant and is going to speak very directly to what, um, to what I certainly see in the world around me. Um, we're going to be looking at this chart more than once. And we're going to be looking at this chart and we're going to be revising it. And if you want to draw one for yourself, leave space. Because we're going to get to chapter 7, 8, 9, and then we will have the four beasts. Right? So here we have the four metals, the four layers in the statue. And later on in the book, we'll have the four beasts, and then the four beasts with the horns, and the horns that divide up and split up. And you'll see how they, how they parallel or how they don't parallel. And that's an exercise that we're going to be working on. Um, okay, so the texts are on the second page of the source sheet. And if you open up the, the link, which is Daniel chapter 2, it, that will take you straight to Chabad.org, English with Rashi. I've got in front of me the uh, Art Scroll Daniel which I have written all over, and I'm going to be reading the translation from here. We're going to stick with the English. Um, there is such a thing as the study of Biblical Aramaic, and I'm not showing off, but I did pass the course. First year in college in London, I passed Biblical Aramaic, and this is literally all that we study. This and there's another couple of dozen words elsewhere. Very, very difficult course, but it doesn't really impact upon what we take away from all of this. A large portion of the book is in Aramaic, and the general thought is that the entire book was originally written in Aramaic, and the Hebrew parts are a translation. That doesn't come to us from Jewish sources, but it certainly makes a fair amount of sense. The, um, <coughs> the Jewish sources that talk about it say, well, the narrative is in Hebrew, consistent with the rest of the Tanakh, and the uh, conversations are recorded exactly how they were spoken in Aramaic. Aramaic is the, the language of the time and the place, and there are certainly those among the commentaries who say that it is the language of the Kasdim, the Koldis. It is the language of the court magicians, who were the landsmen, as, as we say, the um, people from the same country, uh, Babylon, as, as Nebuchadnezzar the king. Because we'll see that there's a huge variety of different types of magicians, astrologers, necromancers, etc., etc. And included in, among them is, of course, Daniel. And if Daniel is an exile, a uh, captive, literally, from, uh, from Israel, uh, many of the other wizards must have been as well. And Aramaic was the, the language of the time, the language of the people that probably educated Nebuchadnezzar as well when he was a child. So it's a, it's a familiar language, or, or the, other, the other side of that term is that Aramit is the language of magic, the language of astrology. If you've ever had an astrological reading in the conventional sense, um, it's a different language. It's a different set of terminology altogether. So that may, that may be also part of it. Let's get started because this is a longish chapter and we've got quite a few texts to look at. Um, the references I'm going to be calling on are the bright red numbers on the right-hand side. We're not going to read every single one of these things, but it's, it's important to dip into them because there's, there's some important stuff here. Okay, ready? Daniel chapter 1, 
Verse number two. In the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar dreamt dreams. There is a lot to be said about the, the years. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, an enormous amount to be said about the dating of when this was, the second year of his reign, what exactly has happened. Um, I think that the book of Daniel itself is intentionally skipping over the details. There's also the fact that they counted years very differently. They didn't have the, n the numbering of years that we have, um, either from the Jewish point of view or from the others, or the Chinese year, or the Arabic year. None of this was known at that time at all. And the year is relative to the king's reign. So I really do think that the book of Daniel is skipping over a lot of details. And if you take the time and look at the whole book and read through the whole book from beginning to end, I think most of us have uh, time on our hands right now. This is something to do, read through the whole book beginning to end, because you're gonna see that chapter three builds on what we have here in chapter two. And how we read chapter three and the statue that the king makes depends to a large degree on how we read here chapter two. Um, I think that a lot of the details are intentionally being fuzzed and just left out because there's much, much more important stuff to, to talk about. Okay? Nebuchadnezzar dreamt dreams. Let's take a look in Rashi, uh, sor source number one. Nebuchadnezzar dreamt dreams. He had more than one dream. His spirit was agitated and his sleep was interrupted. Right? If you're looking at the Chabad.org translation, you may have a slightly different version, but don't worry. Uh, source number one, Rashi on Daniel, uh, chapter 2, verse 1. He brings up the comparison with Joseph. Again, homework, if you have some time, go and read the Joseph story, because it is exactly parallel to this in many ways, and diverges in many ways. Pharaoh dreamt a dream that tipa aim rucho his he he was worried whereas here it's that tipa aim rucho he was very worried right because with the pharaoh he uh in egypt he knew what the dream was he had loads of people explaining it badly and ineffectively and unsatisfyingly to him but here the dream is totally gone from him uh, if you zip ahead, note number two, which is actually a couple of lines on, uh, text number two, Ibn Ezra on Daniel. He is quoting a Chad Min Onim. I'm reasonably certain he is referring to Rav Sadji Gaon, but perhaps not. Um, Nebuchadnezzar did remember the dream. Uval Nasot Chachamav. And he wanted to test his wise men. Were they really in tune with the place where dreams come from? Right? And we're going to get into this in the next text. Where do dreams come from? This is a whole completely separate subject, and we did a very nice course with this um, at Shir Chadash a couple of years back, uh, studying the, the works of Tzadok HaKohen. So that's Hasidus, and that's um, Zohar, but this is, this is where we're dealing with it. Where did dreams come from? And we have a Tanchuma that's going to start explaining this, but let's read the text first. The king said to call the necromancers, the astrologers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans to tell the king his dreams. There's one, two, three, four, five different types. One, two, three, four. Five different types of wise men are here. I don't believe they had wise women in those days. Certainly didn't talk about them. And the Mitsudot and Rav Saad, you go into a fair amount of detail as to what they all were. We're not entirely sure what they were. Um, Kasdim, says uh, Rav Saad, you go on. Kaf Sindal, he's reading it like a Kaf Shin. Shedim, those who had contact with spirits. In any, in any event, he had a whole array of people there with him. And the word Kaldes or Kastim, you've got to go to the Aruch, you've got to go to some very serious um, 
study sort of stuff to figure out exactly how this works. But Chaldeans is the Greek and Latin version of Kastim. That is straight out of the, uh, the Aruch. Um, specialists in astronomy and astrology. My sort of stuff. My kind of people. And they came to tell the king his dream. They came and they stood before the king. And the king said to them, I have dreamt a dream and my spirit is agitated to know the dream. This is where the Aramaic part starts. And the Chaldeans, the Kastim, spoke to the king in Aramaic. As we said at the very beginning, probably the language of the king himself, his own mother language, the Mama Lashem. And that was their language and that was the, the stuff that they, they did, astrology, and they spoke in Aramaic. May the king live forever. Tell your servants the dream and we will relate the interpretation. Sounds reasonable, right? Sounds very reasonable. The king replied to the Chaldeans, the thing has escaped me, right? He doesn't say exactly I don't remember it, which is gives Ibn Ezra and whoever the other Gaon he's quoting uh, room to say, yeah, he's, he's holding back from them. The thing has escaped me. If you do not make it, the dream and its interpretation known to me, you will be cut into pieces and your homes will be made into a dung hill. Yep. It's exactly what the, what the, the Aramaic text says. <coughs> um, not pleasant um, set of options. Tell me the dream, tell me the interpretation, or that's it. If you do tell me the dream and its interpretation, you will receive from me gifts, rewards, and great honor. Tell me the dream and its interpretation. Let's take a look at text number three. Text number three is taken from the Tanhuma Buber. It is the other Tanhuma, one of, one of the Midrashim, and... Um, you know, on various occasions, we spent a fair amount of time talking about um, where all these midrashim come from and who they who they were written by and why and where. Uh, this is one f that Buber produced from a manuscript that is somewhat different from the standard Tanchuma that you might have at home. And thanks to Safaria, we have this we have this in English, right? So look quickly at the English here, and then we'll skip to the end of it, because this is. This is something uh, that I see as a paradigm for how things are going to play out in the world. If you want to know what my version is of how the end of days is going to play out on the world stage and what world leaders are going to be involved and how they're going to act and react, this is, this is it. So Nebuchadnezzar said to them, I know the dream, right? Ibn Ezra. If I tell it to you, you may tell me words of falsehood. You will say, this is the interpretation. Instead, you tell the dream, and then I will know that you are telling me its true interpretation. Now, we got here in the, uh, in the, uh, the block capitals here, repeated that the, the uh, wizards, the, the Kastim say, no one on earth can do this. It's simply not possible. If you zip down about a halfway through, what they're saying is, Listen to this. You've got to see this and you've got to listen to this. This is really important. This is the astrologers, the wizards of the court of King Nebuchadnezzar. And they're talking. And once you know this, then we'll go and you'll see it in the actual text in the book of Daniel itself. You'll say, yeah, that makes sense. While the sanctuary was standing, when someone wanted an oracle, he would ask through the Urim and Tumim. Right? You follow the Torah reading, you, you know what uh, many times, there's a number of times discussed the Urim and Tumim that were a means of somehow getting a direct answer from heaven. There's a, there's a discussion in the Talmud and the commentaries as to exactly how these things worked, but there was a process of having a question asked and having it answered, certainly by a head of state, certainly by the king. When the eternal God dwelt with human flesh, when someone wanted an oracle, he would speak to him. The king said, go and ask him. 
They said, his dwelling is not with human flesh. The thing that the king is asking is difficult, yakar. Yakar is a word that refers to prophecy in the, in the Torah. In, it's a verse in Shmuel. There is no one who will declare it before the king. Aharan is the, her, is the, her, is the word here. There's no, there's no Kohen, there's no priesthood. And they're saying not Aharan, another person to go do it, but Aharon. They are reading that as saying a descendant of Aharon is no longer around to do the needful here in terms of finding out what God wants. If you had one of the children of the children of Aharon, a Kohen, he would have wrapped himself in the Urim and Tumim and told you the dream. Whereupon the king became very angry and furious. He was filled with wrath over them, he said to them, and so the sanctuary was beautiful. And you gave me counsel to destroy it? Immediately, he said, to kill all the sages of Babylon. You've got to let that sink in. And you've got to look at that as how ultimately the nations of the world and their leaders will so deeply regret the things that they have done to the nation of Israel and to the people of Israel. Anyway, we're not here to talk about the end of days too much, but we are, of course, and we can't avoid it. Verse number seven. They answered a second time and said that the king tell his servants the dream. The king responded, I know for certainty that you are buying time. You have seen that this matter is firmly established by me. I'm not going to change my mind about this. Right? If you do not make the dream known to me, your sentence is unequivocal. There's only one thing I'm going to do. So you have arranged lying and corrupt words to speak to me until the time changes. Which the commentaries say is they are um, stalling for time. What I really think until the time changes, um, this is in verse number nine. Um, Ad di idana ishtane, until the time changes, really means until a more favorable time comes along. Uh, astrologers are very, very concerned about times, and not just the weeks, the months, the days, but also the time of the day. So what, what the king is probably accusing them of there is saying, well, it's 10 o'clock in the morning, we will only get to be wise enough at 2 o'clock in the afternoon when a certain star rises, when a constellation is... something like that, until the time changes. I know your tricks, he says. Just tell me the dream, and I will know that you can relate its interpretation to me. Verse number 10. The Chaldeans, the Kastim, responded before the king and said, and here's where, here's where the, the Tanchuma is, is going to be fleshed out. This is where we're getting exactly what it is. And you'll see how, how realistic a reading it is on the part of the Midrash. They said to the king, there is no man on earth who can relate the king's matter. That is why no king, leader, or ruler has ever requested such a thing of any necromancer or astrologer or Chaldean. The king's request is difficult. And there is no other, right? That's the word we, we got here, the Ahoran, which the Tanchuma read as Aharon, lo itai. Someone from, descended from Aharon or Cohen is not around. And there's nothing, there's, there's no hope, except for the angels, whose dwelling is not with human beings. And we do have um, Radak and Malbim talking a little bit about this in terms of what sort of angels the Kastim were in contact with. There are levels of angels, and we, the Kastim, can speak to a certain level of angel. But this type of dream comes from a higher up level of angel. And I'm sorry, O Great King, no matter what you want, we cannot do it. We don't have that level of information. Um, if you have a, if you have the art scroll um, Daniel, they have a nice summary of all of this 
<coughs> with the Midrash Tanchuma, um, written that very nicely and much more clearly in English, um, connected to verse 11 here. Okay, verse number 12. As a result of this, the king grew upset and very angry, and he commanded to destroy all the sages of Babylon. The decree was being implemented, and the wise men slain, and Daniel and his companions were sought to be slain. Where was Daniel at that time? If he was one of the uh, advisors of the king, uh, where was he? Why wasn't he there? Uh, it's, it seems reasonable that he was still in training, that there was a period of three years of training, and this is only two years into it, and he was not considered wise enough or to have studied enough to be, to be called upon, but nonetheless, he was included in the decree to get rid of all of them. Daniel gave counsel and advice to Arioch, the king's chief executioner. We have quite a few times in, in, in Tanakh, certainly in the Nevi'im, uh, we have the, the office of Rav Tabachaya, uh, chief executioner. There are nonetheless um, Ibn Ezra who says that he was the head of catering. Right? A mitbach is today a kitchen in contemporary Hebrew, but uh, he was a chief caterer or it was simply the, the Lord High Executioner. Uh, Gilbert and Sullivan sort of um, reference, of course, not, not intended. But um, he was the head of the police. He was the um, senior security officer of the king. He exclaimed, Daniel gave counsel and advice to Arioch. It seems that Daniel is pretending to not know what's going on here. So he speaks to Arioch and says, what's going on? Why is the king's decree so peremptory? Mahachtsafa. Why is he mimaher? Why is he so in a hurry to get rid of all of the, the, um, with the wise men of Babylon? Then Aryach told Daniel the story. Daniel went and requested of the king that he give him time to relate the interpretation to the king. Verse number 17. Right, we're getting there. The story takes, takes a little bit to unfold. Daniel went to his house and made the matter known to his companions, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, and to pray for mercy from before the God of heaven concerning this secret, al-Raza Dina, right? Raza, secret, so that Daniel and his companions should not be destroyed with the rest of the sages of Babylonia. Okay, after that, in a vision at night, Chesva Dilelia. If you know a little bit of Hebrew, you can figure out a lot of this Aramaic. Uh, do not be put off by it, right? Chesva is Chazon, Lelia, Ha Laila, Raza, the secret. Daniel was told, and he thanked God. And then Daniel says a tefillah, he prays. Daniel said, may the name of God be blessed forever and ever, right? Leheve shmei de la mevarach min alma ve'ed alma. Familiar sort of terminology even from, from our tefillah. We do have these sort of lines both in Hebrew and in English. Wisdom and power belongs to the king. The God, God the king, of course. He alters times and seasons. He deposes kings and establishes kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who know how to reason. This is actually interesting that God, Daniel praises God for saying that he gives Yahav Chachmatal Hakimin. He gives wisdom to wise people. He doesn't give wisdom to stupid people or to people who can't think very clearly for themselves. Right? Wisdom goes to people who know who know how to use wisdom. Knowledge, intuition to those who, who know how to use knowledge and intuition. He has revealed the deep and mysterious. He knows what is in darkness, and light dwells with him. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise, for you have given me wisdom and might, and now you have made known to me what we have requested of you. You have made known to us the matter of the king, and of course our lives are saved. 
Verse number 24. Daniel came to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the sages of Babylonia. And he said to them, Do not annihilate the wise men of Babylonia. Bring me before the king, and I will tell the interpretation to him. Arioch brought Daniel before the king in haste, obviously, and, thus sa and said thus to him, I have found a man from the people of the exile of Judah who will make known the interpretation of the king. Right? Min b'nei galuta di Yehud. Right? That the pish, pishra, the interpretation, pish, pitaron, will make known to the king. The king responded to Daniel, whose name was Belt Shatzar. Right? You've got to remember that Daniel is called Belt Shatzar by King Nebuchadnezzar right at the beginning. His name is changed. And this is something not unlike the name Daniel, judge, and El meaning God, but obviously something connected as a praise to Bel, their God. Are you capable of making known to me the dream that I saw in its interpretation? Daniel answered in verse 27, The secret the king requests, no wise man, astrologers, necromancers, or demonists are able to tell the king. Right here we've got them translating um, Khartumim, Gazrin, as demonists, where we had Kastim translated by Rav Sadia Gaon a little bit earlier on as those who work with demons. So um, there's, there's, there's room to play around with what these, what these uh, sort of uh, wise men and wizards were. No one can tell you this. But, says Daniel, there's a God in heaven who reveals secrets and he has informed King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the end of days. Ba'acharit yomaya. Right? Exactly parallel to the Hebrew term, acharit ha-yamim. Your dreams and the visions in your head on your bed are these. We have a break in the Masoretic text here. Right? And if you're looking, you should see a break of a couple of letters. It is a, it is a closed paragraph. There's a space of a number of letters. And then the text continues. These are the chapter divisions that are inherent in the original Hebrew text. Okay? Verse number 29. And we're going to go into a... Uh, a couple of the texts here in, uh, in my source sheet. Verse number 29. You, O king, your thoughts came while you were on your bed about what would happen in the future. And the revealer of secrets, God, informed you what will be. God sent you this dream because you needed to know this. Let's take a look at uh, text number four, which is Malbim. Here, Daniel is explaining why God revealed all of these future events to Nebuchadnezzar. Right? God just didn't, out of the blue, send a dream to a great king, but the king prepared himself for this. The first line in, in text 4. Your thoughts while you were lying on be in bed was what's going to happen to me after this. You were thinking about succession on your throne. You wanted to know what will be after you. And the revealer of secrets has made known to you. Through this preparation, God revealed to you. Not just what is going to happen after you when your reign comes to an end, but after everything, up to the end of days itself, right? So this is a very, very important piece here that we can get into, and there is a whole other sub subject of the study of dreams. I would love to do that course again if you're interested, how to see and focus on your own dreams. Really, really interesting eonym in, in Reb Tzadok. But look at the Gemara there in Brachot, um, Text number five, it's there in English. A person is shown in his dream only the thoughts of his heart when he was awake. 
evidenced by what Daniel said to Vuchatnezar. Your thoughts came upon your bed. What should come to pass? Exactly here. Talmud in Masechet Brachot 55b, note number 5 here, text number 5, this is a source for where dreams come from. You invite them. And this is something that Rav Tzadok has a great deal to say about. First, clear your mind of rubbish. Uh, don't watch too much TV. Don't get involved too much in what's going on in the world around you. Be open to dreams. And to think about what it is you need to be told about and what type of prophecy you need to receive. Right? <sighs> what else do we have here? Okay, number six, Malbim. Text number six. Yeah. Look at text number six, and then we'll zip on a little bit, because this is going to explain what's coming next. Malbim fleshes out the text here in 30 and 31, and says, and I'm just reading uh, a little bit of this, uh, text number six, that when Daniel started to tell the dream to the king that he saw this huge statue, in that moment, that the dream came back to him. He had, the king, had a waking vision of this statue. He saw the statue again through his open eyes. And Daniel felt this. Daniel didn't see it. He had this information in his head. And he saw that God was sending the king a vision of the dream again. And he talks to him in that particular manner. And with that in mind, that the king has now got the dream back. His eyes are open. He's talking to Daniel. And Daniel is saying, just like we would do, here it is on the screen. Here is a hologram. Here is a projection of it. Look. And of course, the king is scared. The king is very scared. You, O king, were watching. Verse number 31, the statue, which was immense and whose brightness was extraordinary, stood opposite you, and its appearance was fearsome. He could see that the king was shivering and shaking in fear, right? The statue, here we go. This is the bit where we start to do the chart, and this is the part that you've got to keep clear in your mind. And it's really not very complicated. The statue, verse number 32. Its head of fine gold. Not just gold, but its head, Dahav Tav. Zahav Tov. Not just any gold, but very good gold. Its chest and arms are made of silver. Its stomach and thighs of copper. I think I have in, in, I've written bronze in some cases here, but Nechoshet is copper. Nechash, verse 33. Its legs of iron and its feet partly of iron and partly of earthenware. Okay, let that sink in. Head, chest, and arms, stomach and thighs, legs. We're going to see in a moment that Daniel is going to interpret this and he's going to give us a slightly different version. <coughs> As you watched, verse 34, <coughs> a stone was hewn without hands. This is the fifth item. This is the fifth element of the dream. A stone was hewn without hands and struck the statue on its feet of iron and earthenware and crumbled them. You've got to, you know, imagine how ridiculous this statue must have been, right? I mean, obviously it was a vision. If you go to the internet and you Google the words statue seen by King Nebuchadnezzar or Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar's dream, you're going to see a number of classical depictions of it. Our Christian friends are very heavily into this because all of this parallels a certain other book in Christian scripture. And it has a lot to do with end of days prophecies. But just think about this. Very, very ridiculous looking statue. The head is gold. The chest and arms are made of silver. 
The stomach, thighs, are made of copper. The legs are made of iron. And the feet are made some parts of iron and some parts of pottery, earthenware. Very, very peculiar. And the commentaries here, it's, um, it's Malbim again, is telling us that verse 34 was not in the actual dream that he saw when he was dreaming, but is here in the revised vision. Yeah. It's here in the vision that he is getting while he is awake and having the dream interpreted to him. As you watched, a stone was hewn without hands. Below yadayim, below yadayim, no, no hand touched it. And it smote the statue on its feet of iron and earthenware and crumbled them. Right? Both the iron and the earthenware crumbled. Then they all crumbled together, the iron the pottery, the copper, the silver, and the gold. Daku, they, they broke. They were reduced to fine powder. They became like chaff from summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away, and no trace was found of them. And the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and filled the entire earth. This is kingdom number five. Right? We always talk about this as the four kingdoms and the one, two, three, and four that is a complex, um, bifurcated is a nice word, complex kingdom. But the real purpose of all of this is kingdom number five, the stone, which is the kingdom of Melech HaMashiach, the kingdom of the Messiah, the kingdom that is going to be established by God, the kingdom of the supremacy of reason, Torah, and of course, the people of Israel. Okay, so far so good. Um, Breshit Rabbah, text number seven. This is a slight diversion, but it is not. We brought this text up before. It is Breshit Rabbah 68, and it refers us back to the vision, the dream of Jacob. Jacob's ladder. You've got to go back to Sefer Breshit and reread that because we have done this last time and I think the previous time as well that there is a very strong parallel between what Jacob sees in his dream and what Nebuchadnezzar sees in his dream. And this is one of my major points in this whole course beginning to end that you really only can understand the book of Genesis, the book of Exodus, Bereshit, Shemos, Vayikra, and following on that, the whole of human history, with these pictures in mind. If you want to put it into a more uh, faith-based and good way of looking at things, God planned this out. The ladder of Jacob, the nations, the angels going up that ladder. They were going up and going down. They are Sare Arba Malchuyot. Sheshul Tanutan Gomeret Bahen. The angels that go up and go down are not any of the previous interpretations that we all know very well about Jacob's ladder and the angels, but these are the representative angels of the four kingdoms who do have their period of ascendancy, they are going up, but after that, you're dim, they go down. They are going to go down, and then the nation that comes after them will be Yarud Mechavero, will be of a lesser status and value than the previous one. And that's what we're getting in the picture of the dream. The value of the materials that the statue is made out of goes down from top to bottom, but it's broken from bottom to top, right? Gold, silver, copper, iron, pottery. The break comes right at the very end. Okay. Now, says Daniel in verse 36, this is the dream. And we will now tell its interpretation to you. I want to stay with 
Malbim, say with the uh, the sheet, the source sheet here, Malbim on source text number eight. This is a little, it's a little bit difficult if you're following in the, uh, the Hebrew or the Aramaic here, uh, parts of the bodies. Um, you know, for a change, we're dealing with just regular parts of the body. Which is which? Yerech, um, shok, regel, um, leg, thigh, foot. Um, they're terms that should actually be familiar if you've ever gone to the supermarket and bought chicken parts, right? You buy yerach, you buy yerechaim, thighs, shok is um, the, the leg and regal is a foot, right? Um, there's a certain amount of disagreement about which is which, but basically the, the statue and its parts are going from the top down. So we're going from the head being made of gold, the chest and arms of silver, the thigh, the hip, the stomach and the hip is what I would suggest. Uh, the stomach and the thigh bone are copper, the leg, iron, and then the feet are iron and pottery. Hold on to this because we're going to go into verse number 37 here and we're going to get to a little bit of a, little bit of a difficulty here. Okay. You, O king, to whom the king of kings, who is the God of heaven, has given a strong kingdom, power, and honor. He's addressing God. One of the things we see quite a bit with prophets and with characters in the Bible is it looks like they're talking to a human being that is in front of them, but in fact they're addressing God. Or they're having this double meaning conversation. If you look at the Hebrew side, the Aramaic, uh, it should be familiar. Ant Malka Melech Malchaya, right? One of the, um, one of these Mirot that we sing on Shabbat, you are God, are the king, king of all kings, right? You are God of heaven. God has given to King Nebuchadnezzar kingdom, power, and honor. Wherever people, beasts of the field, birds of the sky dwell. He has given them into your hand and made you ruler over them all. You are the head of gold. You, King Nebuchadnezzar, are the ultimate king. You're the bee's knees, as we would say. You're the top. This is the, this is the perfect time. Keep these pictures in mind with the... Um, the birds of the sky dwelling and the beasts of the field. But that's going to come up uh, a little bit later on as well. You are the head of gold. Verse number 39. After you will arise another kingdom inferior to you. Right? Less good than you. And after that, a third kingdom of copper, which will rule the whole earth. The fourth kingdom will be as strong as <laughs> the fourth kingdom will be as strong as iron. And just as iron crumbles and flattens everything, and iron shatters all of the others, it will crumble and shatter. The feet and the toes that you saw, partly of potter's earthenware and partly of iron, it will be a divided kingdom and will have some of the firmness of iron, just as you saw iron mixed with earthenware. Okay. A couple of things about the feet. If you look at text number 10, which is Pirkei Drabi Eliezer, I've got that in English, uh, it takes us back to Genesis again, to Breshit. The story of Isaac and Rebecca and where it all begins. This is, according to the Pirkei de Rabbi Leazar, according to Midrash, according to our sort or my sort of way of looking at things, this is the real connection. This is the real reason why we're learning Daniel, to see what the beginning had planned, what God had put into the absolute beginning of time and the early events of Genesis of our ancestors, 
and here it is spelled out. If you recall, Isaac and Rebecca had difficulty having children, and they prayed, and she has twins in her womb, and they're fighting, right? Esau and Jacob, Esau and Yaakov, right? It Take, takes us back to Sefer Bereshit, chapter 25. The children were fighting within one another, like mighty warriors. She was very, very unhappy. She went to pray, and she went to inquire of God. What did the Holy One, blessed be he, do? Jacob took hold of the heels of Esau to make him fall. This is a picture that we all know very well, right? Esau comes out first, Jacob comes out after him, grabbing onto the heels of Esau. Why? To make him fall. After that came forth his brother, his hand had hold on Esau's heel. Hence you may learn that the descendants of Esau will not fall until a remnant from Jacob will come and cut off the feet of the children of Esau from the mountain of Seir, as it is said, Daniel chapter 2, verse number 45, you saw a stone that was cut out of the mountain without hands. It is Yaakov attacking the feet of Esav. Esav, Edom, however we want to put this in terms of actual terminology and the commentators uh, on these texts are all over the place. What is the last kingdom? The last kingdom is the kingdom of Edom, Esav, Yishmael, some combination of that. And the end is going to come by Yaakov, our descendants, toppling the statue, grabbing hold of the heel, smashing the foot of that kingdom that is built on and follows on all the other kingdoms. Look carefully at verse number 42. In the interpretation here, Daniel says something more than he says in revealing the dream. The etzba'at raglaya, he talks about toes here, right? Whereas when he was telling him the dream, he only said feet. Um, I don't know exactly how this makes a huge difference, but the lower part of the statue, the ankle, heel, foot, partly of iron, partly of earthenware. Part of the kingdom will be powerful, and part of it will be broken. Then you saw iron mixed with clay, earthenware. They will mix with the offspring of men but they will not cling to one another, just as iron does not mix with earthenware. This is verse number 43, and there's a couple of things to look at here. Um, why is he telling us this? Don't we know that it's totally unnatural to have a toe made of iron and a toe made of pottery? But what, what um, Rashi is going to say and what Malbim is going to say is very, very clear. That these two parts of the fourth kingdom will mix together, but will not cling one to another, just as iron does not mix with earthenware. Text number 13, which is Rashi, Mitchatnim yihiyu. These nations, whoever we determine they are, or whoever they actually are, will intermarry. But they will not be shleimim. They will not be perfectly with them. Be'emet uvelev shaleim. They will merge into other nations. Ishmael, Edom, the Islamic world, the Christian world, seems to be. Will mix together. But they will not mix together with a lev shaleim, with a perfect heart. V'date hem, sh- hem shonot and their faiths will always remain different. Malbim, text number 14. Again, if you want, you can see many events of our time predicted here, that the weaker nations in this fourth layer will intermarry with the strong and will mix and mingle with them, and they will have a 
covenant, they will have a treaty. And what is going to happen is the chalashim, the weak, will become stronger than the strong. Because they will never mix together. Because they will speak with two different hearts. And what they will do, the weaker nation, the pottery nation, will be with the intent of, dis of devouring and destroying the kingdom of iron. Right? This is reasonably clear in the text in verse number 44, 43. They will mix with them, but they will not cling to one another. The nation that is described here as pottery is going to take over the nation that is described as iron, and it will do it with subterfuge and the open arms of brotherhood and freedom and getting along. Okay, 44, verse 44. Then in the days of these kingdoms, the God of heaven will establish a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will its sovereignty be left to another people. It will crumble and consume all these kingdoms, and it will stand forever. Obvious what that is, of course, right? The kingdom of the Messiah and the Messianic era. Just as you saw that a stone was hewn from the mountain, not by human hands, and it crumbled the iron, the copper, and the earthenware, the silver, and the gold, so has the great God made known to the king what will happen in the future. This dream is true, and its interpretation is reliable. Right? Very last text on, on my sort sheets. Ha'even romezel even Yisrael. The stone, the rock, refers to the rock of Israel, which will rise through the hands of God, not through our own human power. And this rock will destroy all. And he does have a whole issue with regarding how the, the nations and the elements are um, put together and ordered. And the thing you need to do here is take a little bit of time and read the book of Ezekiel, say for Yechezkel, chapter 38 and 39. I'm sorry, there is, there is some homework here, but we do, we do have time on our hands. Here we have Malbim. Malbim lived in the 19th century. I believe he died in like the 1870s. Uh, so he's relatively recent. And he's talking in the times of the Ottoman Empire. Right? So he has a picture that comes from his time. Just as all the commentaries before him had pictures that were relevant and influenced by their time. And how we see this play out is what we see around. I'm going to read a little bit here from Malbim. It's about a th three, four, five lines down. This is referring to Milchemet Gog Umagog. You've heard this term before, right? The War of Gog Umagog. Shiit Kabtsu Kol Bene Adom. He is reading this differently from everybody else, what Gog and Magog is about. And it's worth noting that what that war is going to be is that all the sons of Edom, Edom being Rome, the Christian Western world, will gather together to fight Neged B'nai Yishmael, the Ishmaelite world. And they will destroy each other as it is written in Ezekiel and in Zechariah. And I am explaining, says Malbim, that Edom is Barzel, the iron, because he is going to be strong at that time against the nation of Ishmael. And Greek, Greece is referred to as copper, and they are etc., etc. Babylon is gold, right? But the point is that Malbim is looking at the War of Gog and Magog, the end of days war, as not to be, as Yechezkel seems to be saying, a war against Israel, but a war over Israel and the nations of the Christian Western world, Edom, are coming to 
defeat and push out the Ishmaelite kingdom, which perhaps is the Ottoman Empire of his time. And of course it didn't happen like that in those days, and I'm not going to speculate on how these things are going to work out, but there are certainly distinct parallels in what we've seen in the Midrashim, uh, certainly the Tanchuma, the Tanchuma Buber that we looked at, certainly the Malbim, and it would be a very, very useful exercise between now and the next time to read up um, on the War of Gog and Magog, uh, Ezekiel, and if you have a chance, look in Zechariah, Zechariah as well, which has similar sorts of stuff. Um, take a look at my chart at the very beginning of this um, this source sheet, the elements of the dream in chapter 2. Have I got it right? Not 100%. But we're going to take a, a little time to review this next time because we're going to see a consequence of this dream and the actions of Nebuchadnezzar, what he does and why. Um, we will be revising this chart. The issue of four kingdoms, gold, silver, copper, iron, iron and pottery, rock, uh, four kingdoms plus one, and then an ultimate kingdom that is the kingdom of the messianic era and the supremacy of the Jewish nation, uh, Am Yisrael, and the arrival of Melech HaMashiach. Okay, thank you for um, spending the last hour with me reading the book of Daniel. We'll be back on Tuesday morning, if God wills it, uh, here on the Facebook channel of Gilat Shir. Hadash.